Well, good morning. Welcome to Grow Forward TV. It's Jim Murphy. I'm, I'm talking today with Hirsch Claff from Claff Realty, founder of Claff Realty, a, a longtime resident here in Chicago, and uh, a guy that's got a lot of experiences here in town and around the world. And um, I think we'll, we'll find it interesting to talk to him both in terms of all different things, including real estate business, uh, farming, um, and general connections between uh, his home country of South Africa and uh, those of us here in Chicago. Welcome, Hirsch. Thank you. Welcome. Awesome. Good to have you here. Great to be. Let's start in the beginning. Tell us a little bit about growing up in South Africa as a kid and uh, what that was like and, and uh, you know, how it got you to, through to come over here. Tell us. Well, um, I grew up in South Africa. My father was an immigrant from uh, Lithuania as a young boy who came by himself when he was 15 years old. Um, and uh, the rest of his family stayed in Europe and unfortunately perished in the Holocaust, so he was a survivor. And um, that growing up as, a, as the only son of a, of a, of a survivor of, of a tragedy like that was, uh, was always on my mind um, in a lot of different ways. And um, one of them was that you kind of always got the sense that maybe things weren't so permanent uh, uh, living in a place in the bottom of Africa where you know, you knew you were different from day one because you were a minority amongst the majority. And uh, so that was something uh, that, that we grew up with as a kind of a weight and an anchor. And what that translated into over time was the knowledge that it was unlikely that uh, I would uh, live out my life in South Africa and I should prepare for moving on uh, to another country, preferably Europe, uh, England, given the fact that England was the mother country of South Africa, if you like, the colony, right. or ex-colony. Uh, but the, the wish was, the dream always was America for my dad, for, for me, because America meant America in those days, you know, kind right. of the land of the free, the home of the brave. Um, I think some of that's still true. I think some of it may be not so true as it was. Um, but um, that was the, the background, and so I was amongst the fortunate few who had a great education, uh, lived in a country where there was an oppressed minority, and eventually became evident uh, that, you know, as I grew up, but, you know, in my teens, and later on, that there were a group of people that were, you know, uh, terribly oppressed, and, 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 um, and, uh, and, 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 and the advantages that we had, uh, the white people in South Africa, was uh, you know a not sustainable and certainly be not not a moral uh, a moral pla a place where you felt comfortable morally right um, and um, uh, you know so it was a, a very uh, uh, complicated um, country to grow up in uh, for all these reasons um, that I've just that I've just described um, I went to a university uh, locally Johannesburg had a I lived in Johannesburg which is um, uh, was then a city of about three, four million people, maybe, um, probably two thirds or, uh, black and one third white, very segregated. I mean, to give you a sense, I mean, it's, you know, it's like the north side and the south side, I mean, <laughs> you know, in the kind of, but in a, right. in a more severe way. Right. And, um, and um, you know, um, the university uh, that we attended. Uh, you went to school where you lived. You didn't go like in the States where you live in Chicago and everybody looks so to we go. We call it a commuter college. Uh, right, a commuter college, essentially. Right. Except it was and is, was absolutely a world class university. Right. And so um, it was uh, not so easy to get into. You had to, you know, pass certain exams depending on what you wanted to study. Um, and um, so I went there, did a, a bachelor degree in economics, that was my main focus and then became a chartered accountant, which is kind of like a, somewhere between a CPA and an MBA, uh, as far as the US is concerned. Right. And worked, um, uh, went to school um, uh, uh, at night and worked during the day for an accounting firm. So you had a lot more practical experience by the time you graduated, which was um, probably the age of 22, because yeah, 22, 23, um, because you did you did the accounting stuff while you were studying, oh, and so you were... You were about 22, 23 when you graduated yeah, with yeah, the degree. Correct. Which, which, yeah. And I had experience because we'd worked during the day kind of thing and went to school at night as opposed to 
you know, just doing an academic. Uh, was uh, it degree. easy to uh, to transfer your accounting training there and be, come over here and, and kind of get into that business? Well, yeah, I mean, there were two things. And while my dad encouraged me to be an accountant, I probably would have been a lawyer, a litigator probably, or kind of enjoy the a good argument and enjoy the the uh, <laughs> and enjoy the idea of uh, of a new thing every day a new you know just a varied subject matter and um, but the fact is that the only thing that was transferable was being an accountant or a doctor I was not going to be a doctor I certainly I didn't have the smarts to be a doctor you had to graduate with certain you know certain marks or results whatever you call them in in, in, in math and science and that wasn't my baby. Um, so I became an accountant with the specific idea that it was transferable. And yes, numbers are numbers are numbers. And uh, the only things that really vary uh, between you know, countries in the world, let's just say the Western world in terms of an English structure, you know, US uh, Western structure, is tax. Right. So when we came here, I came here, with a, uh, joined an accounting firm, which I got the job over the telephone, never been to Chicago before. You know, you say it was an English colony, but didn't the Dutch have a big role there too? Yes, yes. Explain that for us. So, just kind of quickly. Uh, South Africa was founded in 1652 by Dutch, um, by the Dutch. The Portuguese had discovered, had 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 investigated it in the 1400s. Okay, but in 1652, a Dutch, the Dutch colonized Cape Town, the right. Cape, as a they built it up as a way station, a vegetable garden. Okay. Yeah. On the way to the Far East, so that the, the, the so the um, uh, the boats could replenish. So they wouldn't have scurvy. And, and and correct. Yes, exactly. Yes. That's what it was. It was a, it was a way station to the east, and um, so that in 1652, and until um, uh, probably the 18 yeah, 1820s, um, Holland really more or less controlled South Africa, and then the British uh, took over. Probably, again, I'm not so sure, but the 1820s, there was something called the 1820 settlers, which was a big chunk. It's like the Mayflower came to America, they came, the English came to South Africa, 1820, and they colonized a big chunk of it. And then they really controlled the country till essentially 1910 with the Boer War, where they fought the, the Dutch, right. the Burgers, you know, kind of like, you know. Um, um, uh, and, uh, and then until 1961, South Africa was part of the British Empire, part of the Commonwealth. In 1961, South Africa got independence and be kept on part of the Commonwealth, which is, you know, what ex- So for a while, you were English. Uh, I was English at home, so we, our home language was English. Right, right. But, and, and it's a little bit like France, uh, like, excuse me, like uh, Canada. So a person who lives in Toronto supposedly could speak, in, uh, could supposedly speak French, they really can't, right? right? Guys in Quebec could, right? right? So we were like, kind of like Toronto Canadians. Okay, English was our home language. Turned out that because I went to the Army, Air Force, I was in the Air Force, which was, which was a uh, mandatory period, so everybody had to serve, uh, which I think is a good thing. Right. Maybe not that Air Force or that, yeah. <laughs> but, but everybody had to serve. And what was great about that was a coming together of all the cultures. Okay. In other words, people from all different walks of life, religions, wealth, not wealth. Everybody had to serve. There was no. This wasn't right. getting but out of the draft. Probably have less wars if everybody has to 100%, serve. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. So we met. I, I I engaged with people who 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 had never met a Jew before. Um, people from the the country and in, in up in the middle of nowhere in Africa, in South Africa. Right. First pair of shoes they had w was when they came to the army. Right. Okay. And that was an amazing experience. Okay. And, so and how long did you and have I to learned, serve and I for a couple of years? Just a year. And One year. When I was there, it was just a year. They didn't teach you how to fly. No, not perm You had to be permanent force to fly. Right. The Air Force was kind of a cushy thing. Okay. Right. The other guys got into infantry and single. You know, if you were a pretty good sportsman, they took you to the Air Force. Kind of. It was like a bit of a elite kind of thing. It's okay. I, uh, by the way, not elite in, in the true sense. So, um, but in any event, and then it became two years uh, when it became serious when the guys used to go up to Angola and fight against the Cubans on behalf of the American government, basically. South Africans when fought, was that? fought in Angola. That was, it was uh, uh, probably the mid 80s. I mean, when Reagan was president, we right. were fighting the Cubans I remember that as a proxy yeah. war. Okay, so anyway, so that's kind of the, you know, the. So in the late 70s, you came over here? 
1978, I got a call, I was at home, minding my own business on a Sunday night, and a friend of mine called and said, Hirsch, if I'm, I'm in Chicago, I've got a job with a firm, they like me. They said, have you got any more guys like you? And he says, well, I'll call a few buddies, and he called me, because we were at the same accounting firm in Johannesburg. And they said, uh, if you want a job, be here, you know, next week is almost tax season, be here next, you know, whatever, in a week's time, and you can have a job. And I told my wife, I just recently married, I got on a plane and uh, I went to Chicago to start a job, and it was in March 1978. Um, never been here before. Um, you know, kind of, well, I was 20, what was I, 23, I don't remember, 20, you know, didn't have any sense of fear. Uh, it was all an adventure, had right. no money, right. and I had an education, which, and it met the criteria that, oh, I was going to America. Because I came very close to going to England, where my sisters have, li have lived for many years, because that was, most South Africans went to, to England, was easier. So, 78, 79, that was your first winter, what was that like? Yeah, I first went to 1979, uh, I remember I lived in Evanston, my wife and I, she went to Northwestern, she got a scholarship right. um, from, from Northwestern, she was very smart and, 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 and she got a scholarship there and we lived in Sherman and Foster, which was just not far from Northwestern in Evanston and um, you know, I think there was at one stage, you can check the stats, but I think it was like 78 inches of snow on the ground. I remember walking through, <laughs> I remember walking down the sidewalk to the train station and, and I remember vividly that on both sides of the walkway it was piled high with snow and that's, that's absolutely and true. And you don't get a lot of snow and in South Africa. Well, it snowed twice in my lifetime in South Africa. One was an eighth of an inch and one was like a half an inch and my mother had two accidents in her car on the same day because <laughs> nobody did. It. it never snowed there. Okay. Now South Africa, Johannesburg is 6,000 feet above sea level so at least it's, you know, got a chance of snowing but it snowed twice in all my life before I left. Right. So this was a shock. Uh, I, I came to South Africa, I mean I came from South Africa, I never, I did not own a coat. That's a true story. I came to America, I didn't go buy a coat, you couldn't buy a coat in Johannesburg. And, um, and uh, you know, I just did what I did. I didn't have coats, you know, which I found out, the things right. you put over your shoes and right. stuff like that, you know. Well, so fortunately, with, it was global, a shock. with global warming, it's getting nicer here, well, isn't it? Yeah. Isn't the weather getting I tell nicer? You, you know, I came to love a major. I love a major snowstorm. Shuts everything down, quietens everything down. You know, just you know, everybody else is doing nothing. You know, it's kind of it's like a Christmas New Year time. You know, when it snows and nothing hasn't really snowed since then, as far as I'm concerned. No, it's been a while. So. Tell me about this. Uh, so you're working for this kind of yep. substantial accounting firm. Yep. Uh, and then you're picking up some clients. Is that, is that how you kind of got introduced to real estate investment? Well, through those clients? My dad or? was in real estate in South Africa. So growing up as a kid and the only son, I was expected to kind of like, you know, inherit what, I wouldn't call it a business, but inherit the, right. the kind of like uh, the business, so to speak. And um, so since I was eight years old, he would take me along and show me every building he was buying or not buying or farms. We had some farms nearby where we grew fruit trees and we planted trees and you know, did the plowing and I learned to, you know, uh, to prune. I went to agricultural college in the summer uh, to learn how to prune. And uh, so I love farming. I mean, it was in my blood really from the beginning. And, but we specialized in fruit, in fruit farms and in deciduous fruit trees, which is in, so in Johannesburg, 6,000 feet, you can't grow, uh, you know, you don't grow grapes and you don't grow uh, citrus. It's, Oh, grow tomatoes, Pe do you? Uh, yeah, I'm sure they grew yeah. a little bit, but not really. It's not hot enough, you know, because right. it's a thing. Right. They grow plenty of tomatoes, but another, right. another, another part of the country. So anyway, so we, um, um, you know, so... so uh, it was that, in your blood. Yeah, I mean, I, I grew up, I used to go every, get up early before school, would go with my dad, collect the fruit, take it to the market, and then he dropped me at school. It's about seven o'clock, I was... Uh, you know, that's why I still get up. I mean, I'm up every morning, 4.30, and it's Starbucks at 4.30, and that's my, that's my office kind of thing. You go to work, you're yeah. doing this work for these real estate groups right. and uh, right. kind of seeing the business here, yes. and then you decide one day that you want to buy a building. Yourself, well, is that, yeah, is that what, happened, what happened? What happened was the, uh, one, the, the accounting firm I worked for, 
um, was their largest client was JMB Realty. And in the 70s and early 80s, JMB were the kings of real estate, really, all over the United States. Joe Malkin, Malkin and, and, and Neil Bloom. Bloom. And they were amazing to me. I showed up as an immigrant kid, you know, went to, you know, they'd say, where are you from? Where are you from? And, you know, guys like, you know, Judd and Neil and Lee Sachs and Stuart Nathan, John Schreiber. But many, many, today the, the real estate business in the United States is controlled by the Alumni Association of JMB Realty. <laughs> uh, that's true, Barry Sternlich from Starwood, yeah. uh, John Gray who, is, who runs uh, um, about, um, Blackstone's real estate, and uh, you know, uh, um, many, many, many others, Bruce Duncan. Bruce it's, Duncan quite, sure. it's quite amazing if you went and see what those guys control, they, it was, it, they, they really were. So, I met these, all these guys, I was the accountant, but you know, I had to go ask them about this building and how's it performing, and actually they had farmland in Iowa, you know, uh, some of it didn't work out so well, the bees didn't do what they're supposed to do one year, you know, you, you learn stuff. So, um, they were great to me, they, you know, would sit and talk to me, ask me where I come from, what do I do, and, and then one time I remember going to Neil, uh, to Judd and asking him would he sell a building, I was still working there, probably wasn't the right thing to do from a professional standpoint, but you know, we, we spoke about it. So then I, I left the accounting firm when I got a green card after about two and a half years. And uh, I just wasn't a good accountant, um, you know, mentally. Um, and, but it was a great training and I'd had enough. And I went and I got a broker's license and just started business. I shared offices. You know, I had a friend of mine who was an attorney. He let me use the conference room. And uh, you know, I used to work at home from the dining room and, right. you know. So that's how it started. So as a broker, you were starting to, were you actually uh, representing buyers or sellers, or were you actually looking for investments? In, well, in I always, I always uh, had, I always wanted to own. I, I, I was never interested in, uh, listen, I don't know why, but maybe because my dad was an entrepreneur and I saw right. the lifestyle he led. He led. Right. It, it wasn't an excessive lifestyle by any means, but he was his own boss. And I think being right. your own boss was what was attractive. So I became a broker because legally you, you couldn't talk to anybody unless you had a brokerage license. Right. And it wasn't the most difficult exam in the world, no. uh, you know. So, so, and I think they gave me some, some relief because I was a CPA. Like, I, don't, I didn't have to do the salesman's license and then the broker's license. So they let me actually write the broker's license first. And, um, and so I did that and then um, very soon thereafter, just a couple months after I left the accounting firm, I figured out the opportunity to buy uh, a building opposite Marshall Fields, which was the store for men building, and, the, and it was full of doctors and dentists, 25 East Washington. And Marshall Fields at that time was in some trouble, and uh, I managed to get a couple of South African guys I knew who lived in New York, uh, begged them to come to town, and they bought the property. And, um, and that was the first property I bought. And, um, and they said, well, now that we bought it, you better run it, lease it. I said, I don't know, said, just you'll learn. And that's how I started. And so awesome. my expertise was downtown, Wabash and Randolph, office on top, retail at the bottom. I redeveloped all the retail, brought a lot of tenants in that were suburban tenants to, for the first time, like Joseph Bank, uh, which were, you know, and put them on the first floor and the second floor so they didn't have to pay such high rent just being on, on, the, ground, on the ground floor. And then we developed two basements downstairs with health clubs um, uh, and uh, Bally Health Club took a bait. I mean, so we created five levels of retail before you got to the second floor, which was a unique thing. It was the first time in, in, in Chicago that had ever been done. That wow. you had, that you had. That was your first building? First building, 25 years Washington. And so that, I focused on that and I became known you know, I had started having understanding of what rents were and office space and retail. And then I started collecting, you know, buildings so in the area. So basically, you told me a little earlier that your, your real estate career went between Jackson and Diversity? Yes. Is that what you said? Okay. Jackson, Diversity, and Wabash to, to uh, you know, to uh, Clark, maybe. Right. That was it. Wow. That That's was it. That was my universe. I could walk everywhere to what I owned, I mean, and there's, that was great. So at one time you said you owned the Board of Trade building. Yep. Now a lot of us had careers there and spent some of our time there. 
Tell us about that. Tell us about buying it. How long did you own it? What what'd you do? What did you bring to it? The headquarters of Continental Bank were um, just north of the block right. that we're talking about. Right. Um, it was Jackson, uh, Jackson Clark LaSalle, okay, and right. Continental Bank's headquarters were in that building. Continental in those days were you know, one of the top five banks in the United States. And what year is this now you're talking this about? This is 19, uh, hold on a sec, this is probably yeah, 88, 89. So uh, after the crash, 87? Yeah, this is like Penn Square. Remember okay, Penn yeah, Square? Okay. With the, oh, right. This is the 30th anniversary yesterday of the crash of 1987. Correct, correct. And Continental Bank bailed out... Uh, Penn Square Bank. Uh, Penn they Square. Bailed out, bailed out the CBOE. CBOE. They bailed out everybody. They bailed out and everybody. Then they got bailed out. Yeah, yeah. So um, they had accumulated through a, friend, through a very close relationship with Gordon Prussian. Gordon Prussian, who passed away about a, year, a couple of years ago in his 90s, he started and owned uh, General Parking for many years. And he was a very close uh, um, customer and friend of, of, of the senior management. So they asked him to accumulate quietly the block south of them because they wanted to build new, their new headquarters. Okay? And so he went and he bought the 111 Jackson building with the Union Tanko Corporation used to right. be. He bought 327 South LaSalle, which was a rinky-dink right, little building. building with a little restaurant downstairs right. and stuff. And he had an office in that building for a while. <laughs> right. I think everybody did. They had, it was like a rabbit warren, right? right. There were, right. Uh, you know, 25 tenants a floor, right? Right. And, um, and then there was a big parking garage as well. So he accumulated right. it for the Board of Trade quietly. Excuse me, for Continental Bank. And then... Continental Bank got into trouble, and the government made them divest all their non, their non real estate. You know, I mean, things that they held for their own use, and so they put up for sale. And I heard about it, and um, amazing story. But um, managed to find a, a, a partner, a local partner in Chicago, a family who I'd never really knew or invested with before. Went to see the bank, managed to somehow get in to see them. I can't remember exactly. Jack Neal was the head of real estate, mm -hmm. if I remember. And um, we bought the entire block for a very, very, very good price. So it's the block to the east of the actual original board of Correct. trade building. There was the a street there that ran. Right. It was called. Well, it was. I think it was. Uh, yeah, LaSalle Street. It was a, it was a continuation of LaSalle. Right. So it right. was really Van Buren, Jackson, LaSalle, and Clark. Right. Uh, what was it? Sixty thousand square foot of land or something. But it had. The Union Tank Court building, which is still there, called 111 Jackson. Right. And of course, it has on the whole back part the Board of Trade built their facility extension, the extension annex, which yeah. I don't know, I don't think it, it's work, I don't think it isn't, is open anymore. Or I whatever. think they're going to turn it into a movie theater. <laughs> yeah. well, that was when yeah, uh, the, the, the trading business was starting to change somewhat. Right, right. So, so then you eventually. Um, we sold the back part to the Board of Trade, mm -hmm. and they built the building. I think Richie Stein uh, was the developer right. for them, and we kept the front part, sold off the back, paid down the basis, and then developed and re rehabbed the, the, the front building, 111 Jackson. Wow. So you were an early developer um, on Oak Street. Yeah. Uh, listen, I don't like to call myself a developer because I don't develop. I don't like to develop. It's okay. too complex. You've got to be too good for that. Most of what we've done, and we'll get into that later, I suppose most of what we've done, I like to buy existing things. Right. I, want to, I don't buy vacant land that I can, I, I'm not a builder. I don't want to take the risk. I, I, don't, I, I can't read a set of plans. Too complicated for me. I've got ideas, but I, I don't know how to technically develop, okay? So you learned that part of GMB. Well, I learned, to, I learned, I just watched, uh, in my experience, I realized that the first people who develop are very, are very, are, are most times the guys who lose the properties and the right. other guys who buy the things make the money. Right. Okay. <laughs> so, um, you know, and I, and, I, and I never wanted to take the risk of signing personally on loans, which is a whole nother. It's a good game. policy. Yeah, very good policy. Good I learned, policy. That, learned that from my dad. Always avoided that personal guarantee yeah. stuff. Yeah, no, no. personal, no. Um, so um, anyway, so um, we um, the, so what happened was um, I started buying really high quality retail properties, state in Washington, the corner of state in Washington, where which was next door 25 East, which was where there's an old Navy on the corner now. Right. It was a one-story building. There was grass growing out of the roof. Right. I could look down on it. Great corner. A jewelry company owned the property, Whitehall Jewelers, which was. Um, 
bought that, bought the corner of Wabash Randolph, which is where we had all the retail and the parking garage, right. office in Marshall Fields. Um, I bought a building at the corner of Clark and Diversity in 1985 or four when it was a shitty neighborhood. Um, but great corner, great corner. I only buy corners, you gotta buy corners. Right. That's my rule, even today, I only buy corners. I may have breached that once or twice, but I don't think so. And, um, and then, so, Somebody approached me and said, Barney's from New York is looking for a location in, you know, in, in Chicago. They had their main store in uh, Chelsea on 17th or 18th Street. It was an iconic store. Right. Still is, but different. And it was owned by a family, uh, the Pressman family. A little dysfunctional, but interesting. And, um, and so they were looking to come to Chicago, and they were looking on Michigan Avenue, and everyone was looking on Michigan Avenue, and you know, there wasn't anything there for obvious reasons. So I, I, um, there's a friend of mine, a guy I knew in Chicago, Alfie Dancona, um, whose family had been, has been here for many generations. Right. And luckily enough, his, great, his grandfather bought some great little corners in Chicago. And so uh, he owned the corner where the Oak Tree restaurant was, which was you know, well known in right. Chicago. So I negotiated with him to buy the property for a big price, which was you know, then everything was a big price, right? And um, I got control of it, and then I went to see, I went to see the Pressman family in, 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 in New York, and I basically said, I've got an incredible location, you're never gonna get on Michigan Avenue, Oak Street is gonna be the next Madison Avenue, so you don't have to be on Fifth Avenue, you wanna be on Madison, and that's how I kind of sold Oak Street as being a Madison Avenue, kind of a second, but more high-end, more fashion-oriented street. And um, I remember sitting in the offices with all the people walking around and models and uh, I mean, just it was like crazy, okay. Him, there were two brothers and the, and the father. Um, I mean, characters, unbelievable. Egos, like, you know, right. tr Trump style egos, right? And um, New York, New York. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, anyway, they, they kindly said, okay, they came to see it and they liked it and they decided to build a store. They wanted us to build a huge store. I said, no, 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 I don't build, but I'll buy the land, I own the land, I'll give you a ground lease, and you build the store. So they got their Japanese partner, which was a huge company from Japan called Isatan, who had bought 50%, and they had given them the money to expand the, 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 all over LA, and that, that's what actually got them in trouble eventually. So we took no risk, we just had the land, we got a 10 or 11% return on our investment, and they built this fantastic property that we would never have, you know. It's a beautiful building. Great, I'm talking about, this is the old one. I'm talking about the one, this is in, we built, they built the first one where they then moved across the road afterwards. Oh, wow. This was the first building where, um, for example, Buzzy Kayla had a store, um, there was a linen store, a fancy linen, I had to buy out all those leases, that's a whole nother story. But anyway, they built a two story or three story building okay, on the I corner. That. Yeah, and that was the first, and we owned the ground. Right. And because um, I didn't want to get in, I didn't know their right. credit and stuff. So we owned that and eventually we sold the land to the Japanese. We knew eventually the Japanese would want to buy it and we sold it and made some really good money. And we bought, so uh, my mistake was, I didn't really have the capital, was I should have bought up the whole of Oak Street because that, that, that store set Oak Street uh, alight. So whatever you see on Oak Street or Walton or whatever is because of Barney. So there was a point in time in which you uh, you wanted to uh, own the Chicago Cubs, and and today is the morning after the Cubs were eliminated from uh, the World Series or making the World Series this right, year, unfortunately. Right, right, right. And uh, that was back when uh, and Tom Ricketts actually bought the yeah, club. Yeah, eventually. Yeah. Um, tell us about that and 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 how that how that thing how does somebody go about to try to do that and uh, and you know what'd you learn from that? Well. You know, it was an incremental uh, thing. It wasn't like, you know, I, I made a billion dollars and I want to buy the Cubs or I want to buy a team, which is normally how things work in this country, right? And to me, it, I looked at it strictly as a, as a unique asset, as a, I wouldn't say just a real estate asset, but a unique asset. I'm a collector, I try to be a collector of unique things. Wherever I am in the world, I try to buy special, special things, unique things. You know, if I buy something, if I buy a house, I buy it on the water. I'd rather pay for it. Uh, you buy the best or you don't buy. And my experience is 
in 35 or 40 years is the best get be gets better. So something that's limited in supply. 100%. That's the, that's the single the only key to anything. Anything is supply and demand. I don't care what it is. Stocks, well, everything is supply yeah. and demand. So um, basically, it, it started off in a really interesting way. It's just a simple thing. I was sitting, we used to go to the Cubs games occasionally. My son is a White Sox fan, but I used to go to the games and with him. I, that's where I learned the game. South Africa, baseball doesn't exist. So it wasn't even, a, I didn't even know anything about it. Cricket is the closest thing, but right. it all comes from actually rounders. The rounders is a game that's played in England, and the rounders became baseball. That's the founding thing. The founding game is called rounders. It makes some sense okay. in England. So anyway, so I was at a game with a friend, and um, I said to him, you know, just talking, you know, everybody, they don't really watch the game when you went to the Cubs. You just had a few beers and talk, and eventually you're either can't see or you or it's time to go home right <laughs> <laughs> didn't have uber back then <laughs> didn't have uber back then i took the train the l from wilmette right? And, right and that was it but basically i said to this, this friend of mine i said to this friend of mine i said you know it, i think it, actually if i remember correctly my son was about to have his bar mitzvah and i said you know what i'd love to buy him as a gift okay is a ticket a, a, a ticket forever at the White Sox. It happened to be, I'm sitting at the Cubs, but he's a White Sox fan, my son. Rabbi, right. very, loves, loves all sports. And um, so my friend said, he says, what are you talking about? I said, you know, you can't, I can go and buy a season ticket, but every year he's got to pay, some, pay for something. And if uh, Jerry Reinsdorf doesn't like him or anybody else, they can cancel it. So you've you really got nothing. And so I want to give him a gift that I could say, here is a seat or two seats forever. You know, thing. So he says, he said to me, he says, you know, this, the, the Cubs are like the Zell ones, you know, the Tribune wants to sell the Cubs. I said, shit, really? I didn't even know. Okay. And then I said to myself, hmm, that's interesting. So as I was thinking, I was talking about it at the game, and then I went home and did some research, and I found out that the, that the Cubs were one of three, only three teams out of 32 teams in Major League Baseball that owned the stadium that they played in. And I don't mean just the bricks and mortar, but the land as well. And the other two were, the, were, were, were um, uh, St. Louis, okay, right. and Boston, right. and Chicago. Three out of 32. Those are three of the more valuable franchises. Um, well, yeah, more valuable, not the, the most. Not okay. the most, I but mean, three of the top six yeah. or seven. No, no, right. Eight. I mean, uh, no. and, and, with, and because also they're in high density population areas, right. which of course is important. So when I realized that, the, that, that Wrigley Field, you know, that this was, you could buy it and have complete control. You didn't have to go to the, 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 the government or the city to get approval to change the rent or to, you know, build a new school. I mean, you may need zoning, but you didn't need approval because you had a landlord. Right. Okay? I, you know, so that was very, very different. And my concept was, which I thought through, and eventually it ended up being a book like this, which is really something amazing because I knew nothing about sport and nothing about television. I knew nothing about many of these things, but incrementally over a period of nine months or a year, I investigated every aspect of gen income generation and how you could do it and how you could substitute. But my basic idea was that I wanted to sell at least a third of the seats to the high ink. Uh, you know, in other words, let's just say everything, you know, like, like within seat license. Not a seat license, a fee ownership condominium ownership of. Uh, so I could go to you, who is a Cubs fan, and say, you could buy row this, these two seats, and it's yours forever. Give me two hundred fifty thousand dollars. And 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 own it forever. Not a license, not of this, but own it forever. You would never have to pay any rent because you you it's like buying a condo or buying or renting a, right, a thing. Right. And through that, a number of different businesses would become evident, like what was there before, you know, StubHub, and you could, you could sell these things, you could finance them, you could rent them out, and you could give them to your heirs. So I could say to my son, he has two seats at, at, at thing, and you can own it forever. They'd be tradable. And they'd be tradable. And there, and they'd be mortgageable. I mean, it would be like, think about just a condominium. And that, if you played that model and you went all the way along in terms of the other income streams, because the one thing that does change right. is you would lose 
ticket sales because you can't get ticket sales once you've sold the thing. But the magnitude of selling 20, I forget, 31, I think there's 31,000 seats at Wrigley Field when I looked at it, if I, my, my brain, okay? If you took 20% of the seats, 25%, and sold them, and you took the seat, the annual um, uh, value of the seat, and you kept it, you, you put an income stream on it, and even in those days at five, you got to like 75,000 a ticket, 80,000. When you did that, you know, 5,000 times, you had enough money to buy the team. So, so that, and then the real estate to develop in the area because people were ripping off. And my biggest thing was, the, and I recognized this right away, the, 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 the buildings around there yeah, was, the was a total ripoff. It was like people, uh, it was intellectual property that was being invaded. Right. I would have gone to court with them no matter what. This was, Ill this was just against, the, against you know, basic inte intellectual property rights, right? right? Somebody peeping through the, you know, right. you can't do that. Rick has had to deal with that. Well, that's, okay. So my idea was, was and actually carrot and stick buy some of those things because the income you could value when it was part of a group like the Cubs with all the media and stuff was worth 10 times earnings, whereas these little guys were making kind of no money and you could right. buy it for two times. So right. you buy it for right. two times and you sell it for 12. Right. Anyway, there were a million things to do and uh, at the end of the day, we, I, I had financing for it, I had the money for it from, from, from a group of significant people, really significant. Um, including David Simon from Simon Prob. I mean, there were guys, you know, who could, we had the money, okay? But I, and I went to see Major League Baseball and had an interview and they went through the motions. I, I kind of knew that they weren't interested in a kind of an entrepreneur owner and certainly maybe not a foreigner. And actually a cute story when I sat down with this, in, at, at the offices in New York and the, 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 the you know, the, uh, the room, I mean, the table went forever. And I'm sitting there with just with two people, me and my lawyer. And I said to the president of Major League Baseball, forget his name, it wasn't the commissioner, but the president. I said, just let me, let me just say that I never grew up, I remember saying, I said, I never grew up with a mitt underneath, going to sleep with a mitt and a ball underneath my pillow. <laughs> okay? <laughs> I said, so let's, let's get that out. I said, let's get that out. I know that's worrying you, you know, do I love the game? And I said, I love the game, my son played the game, I'm an American citizen, I didn't know there were different classes of American citizens, okay? And let me just make it clear to you that many American citizens owns, own football teams in England, right. like Manchester United, right. okay? And with all due respect, if you know, in other words, it's almost like, you know, restraint to trade, you know? So that was the first thing I said to them right away. Probably should have waited on that one. No, I don't think so. You know what, you've got to own the agenda, and again, right. Look, I think the reason they didn't take me was kind of the same reason why they didn't take uh, the guy, what's his name, the guy from Shark Tank. Um, Mark Cuban? Mark Cuban, but in a different way. Mark Cuban, they considered to be just a lunatic, okay? Right. Which they may or may not have a case there. But um, I wasn't a lunatic, but I was a little too aggressive. And, you know, it was like, as I tell people, and I told Ricketts as well, Tom, I said, you had a billion dollars. I wanted to make a billion dollars by owning the Cubs. That's the difference. So we never got it, but it was an incredible experience, but very much consistent with everything I've ever done, even to date, about buying unique stuff. I don't buy average stuff just because it's cheap. I try and find, they may not be pretty, but I try and find unique assets. So we're sitting here in the beautiful space of local foods, and at some point in time, you decided to transition your real estate business towards... Uh, the grocery store business. There probably was a stop in between where you were yep. doing some big box stores. But uh, just from a time standpoint, yeah. we have to watch ourselves here a little bit. But I'm wondering about your transition into um, big box and then grocery business and the food business. Tell right. me about that a little bit. Right, so really quickly, um, from owning all these assets that I had you know, within that geographic area of Chicago, Okay, it turned out one thing that changed was in the crash of 1990, 91, 92, early 90s in real estate, which was a really major depression. There was the Kuwaiti time of the war. Yeah, the war, and I mean, yeah. it was just, it was yeah. just in real estate, there was no money, not some money, but no money. Okay, and values were just, you know, today what was then, people were asking for a building. Today is the rent on that building. 
in Chicago. Okay? Um, but in any event, um, the banks were in trouble, and well, I took advantage of that, went around, scrounged around for some money, equity, because you couldn't get debt. And we bought a couple buildings with, um, with uh, actually, with Blackstone, we, the forerunner of the Blackstone funds, uh, the two deals that they did before they really established the big funds were with me. Wow. And uh, yeah, it's kind of an interesting story. And the reason that is John Schreiber. So Schreiber, was he head of it then? He had just left JMB, and right. that's kind of where I knew him. And uh, my, my office, my, my desk was outside his office. I was an accountant, and I used to know him a little bit. A great guy, very nice, gen and, and I used to see him at the East Bank Club every morning at quarter to wow. five in the morning. He still works out. Yeah, he still does. He's, yeah, he still does. And um, so he left JMB and was asked by Blackstone, Schwarzman and, 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 and Pete Peterson, I don't remember how they got to him, but he left, to start a real estate business. And he said, you know what, okay. So he told me about it and he said, Hirsch, if you find something, you know, bring me something. And I did. And they did two deals with me, the first two deals, interesting deal. The first employee he, he hired, which I had a kind of like teach thing, we were looking to buy this big portfolio of, right. of shopping centers from Kmart, which was in trouble, was John Gray. Okay. John Gray today is, is, will be, I mean, if I read correctly, the next CEO of Blackstone, of the whole of Blackstone, after Shoresman. And um, in those days, real estate was a, a pimple, wasn't even, it was an idea. So the first two deals they ever did were with me. In fact, if you look at the offering memorandums, they talk about pre-fund. That's my two deals. They were very successful. Um, and um, anyway, so, so one of the big things we bought was a shopping center in Naperville, which is the first time I went from State Street to Naperville. Right. Never been out of Chicago in terms of buying. And I got involved and started understanding it. And a lot of those big boxes were tenants there in those days. They were Sports Authority and uh, Montgomery Wards and Kmart and um, Linens and things. I mean, just, just you know, Melville Corporation. It, it was the start of the big box world, okay, in 1992, 3, 4. And um, uh, anyway, so um, I realized that there were some leases that were very, very, very cheap, like the Kmart lease was paying $2 a foot, okay? per year, per square foot, per year. Fixed leases, no. Anyway, Kmart got into trouble. I went and bought, took over their lease, divided up into three different tenants, leased it out. Barnes & Noble were those first tenants. I mean, just, I'm trying right. to remember. And instead of $2, we got $10 a foot. So I said, that's interesting. So I followed that all the way through, and then Kmart got into trouble. And then we went into bankruptcy court when these companies went bankrupt, Montgomery Ward, Levitt's Furniture, uh, um, you got a kind of a reputation of, of bankruptcy court stuff. Well, that's where I that's where I got involved with all these right. big retailers that right. went that went bankrupt. They had all these dark boxes, and we would go in on a nationwide basis, do the due diligence. I put together a team of people all right. over, right? And then you went to bankruptcy court. You had a bid. No, it's not thirty day due diligence. You do your due diligence first, and then you go bid, and you either walk home with nothing but a legal bill or a travel bill. Or you've got to give $100 million to close a week later. It was a very high barrier to entry, but we got involved in it. And ultimately, over five, seven years, became the largest and the most successful in that area. And I was backed by uh, Lubert Adler Partners, which was Harvard and Yale and, and a bunch of other people, including private families and stuff. So that got me into understanding big box retail and the value of leases, which were cheap, which people looked at as a liability. It really was an asset. Nobody understood that. That's being an accountant when you can actually look at a balance right. sheet and right. take a liability and make it an asset actually makes a big difference. Right. Right? We started buying bankruptcy claims and bidding on these things. And um, it, was a, it, was a, it was a monopoly before we got involved. The liquidators kind of owned the business. I'll leave it at that. Um, and we were the disruptors of that business because we just worked harder and did more due diligence. And that's, so that business ended, we did very well. And then the next thing was, okay, so what am I going to do next? And basically the next thing we did, which was my idea, was to go after retailers that weren't dead, but certainly weren't very healthy. But the key thing is they had to own a lot of their real estate. So the first thing we would do is look at the 10K, which is the filing, and it gives a list of every property they own by Alabama. I mean, I think Alabama's always first or something, you know, by, by state. And if, if there was stuff in, on the West Coast, 
or in Chicago, we'd, be, we'd go after it. If it wasn't, if it was Alabama and, and, and Michigan and Ohio, no interest. And that's how we got involved. We bought the first thing that was sale that I approached was uh, Target, which was owned by, excuse me, Mervyn's, which, which was a chain owned by Target that they wanted to divest because it was outside of their court. It was kind of a discount, uh, a discount chain, um, uh, super, uh, not supermarket, discount um, apparel chain in the West Coast. So the real estate was amazing, but the business was terrible because they didn't know how to run it or didn't care, it was too right, small. Right. So we evaluated all the real estate. We made a bid based on the real estate value as if we were just buying real estate. We got the company for free and then we went about operating the company. So how did that morph into the, into the grocery store? Well, store? then that was when we decided to buy companies that had, were rich in real estate that were underperforming. And Albertsons, which was a big public company, was one of them. We also bid on Toys R Us, had the same, same, same concept, okay? And that's how we got into the grocery business, was buying Albertsons, spinning off certain of the, 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 the better stuff, remaining with the lesser stuff, and a lot of the real estate. We thought it was a liquidation or a possible liquidation of three, four hundred stores. Turned out we had a great management team. They turned it around. Then we started buying more stuff and turning it around and buying it. And today it's a 60 something $5 billion sales company with 2,200 stores in 35 states with 14 different brands. So unintended consequences sometimes. You, buy, you know, But the key thing is to buy things where you know your downside's limited. Right. And then things happen. Good things happen, bad things happen. But You've got to make sure that your, your basis is covered. So how do you feel in that space today in terms of 2,200 stores across the country? Yeah. A, lot of, a lot of people talk about, uh, in, uh, in town here, Jewel. Sure, sure. Jewel. Jewel's a great brand and yeah. actually is, is a jewel in the crown. Uh, it's, it has, I think, the biggest market share, I think, of almost any supermarket. You know, a lot chain. of people in this business yeah. tell me about the upcoming demise of Jewel. Yeah. And I look at them and I say, guys, they own all their real estate. Their cost to fix is a lot less than the cost to start. Correct. And build. Correct. Okay. And you, so do you see Jewel being able to adjust their stores in a way faster, better, and be competitive uh, with how the markets? I, I heard a quote you once said it's the battle in the grocery store business is not going to be over the price of milk, but the price of lobster. Do you still feel that way? Is that? Well, uh, you know, I, uh, I'm, uh, again, could you show me that quote, please? No, no, no. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you um, what, it, what it really is. I think, firstly, Jewel um, uh, has an incredible brand name. And I know that because when I came to this country, I was just a wide-eyed consumer. I didn't have any predispositions of my parents shopped here, et cetera, right. et cetera. So I shopped at Dominic's. No, no, okay, I actually did. Okay, so everybody had their preference, right? I mean, for whatever reason, either they live near there or they like the service or the right. prices or something. I can't even remember, but it was a. They were both great supermarkets. If you couldn't get to the one, you'd go to the other. Okay, there was, you know, but maybe if your grandfather went to Jewel, you'd you'd go to Jewel as well. Yeah, okay, like it's like the Sox and the Cubs, right? If you were you were a Sox or a, you know whatever. Okay, um, and there wasn't that much difference between them in those days. Okay, just. I don't know. There wasn't really any defining difference, right? Um, today, um, so let me say this. Um, um, the things that, that um, I think it's important to understand or, or is that, you know, what's really going on today is people talk about Amazon. Amazon, 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 okay? The fact of it is Amazon has, has dramatically... Uh, impacted valuations of companies today in the space. Valuations. Like Kroger's gone from a seven and a half times multiple to a five and a half times multiple. Gone from $35 a share, I think it sits at 22. Great company, well run, well capitalized, ain't going anywhere, has 3,000 stores, owns 40% of their stores. I may not like some of the markets they're in, like I said, you know, Ohio and, you know, Michigan, okay. Um, but but so so it affected value. Look what it did to Walmart. I mean, initially, right? It's, you know, devastated it. De you know, meanwhile, so it's about valuation. The actual effect that Walmart, that Amazon has today on food products 
I think maybe, or the internet really, e-commerce really today, I think is about 8% or 7% food products. And that would be ketchup and, and hard goods and water, and you know, obviously, which is a lot of what people buy because it's difficult to handle and ship. I mean, to you know, take from the schlep, I guess, mm -hmm. use a word. Um, and um, actual food, uh, perishable food in the internet today is, is 1%. Right. Okay, so I think just, it's like everything in this country, particularly, overshoots. It's like, you know, the pendulum is there and there, and it's always perception, and the, and the crowd goes that way, and the crowd goes that way. I think it's important to keep, uh, you know, to keep focused on what the reality is versus the perceptions that are floating around, okay? Now, um, uh, having said that, there are things that, um, that a company like Jewel needs to do, but is very well positioned to do so. We have... Um, we have, uh, whatever, I don't know, 100 and something, 130, 40 stores, you know, 50 stores in the market. Um, they're near the customers. Amazon went and bought Whole Foods, which has maybe, you know, 30 something stores, okay, so they don't have the same coverage, and that's true about the United States. There's 400, there's 400 and something uh, Whole Foods stores. Right. So think about where they are and what they cover, and by the way, there's, I think, 45, 50 million. Um, Amazon Prime customers. So something in that equation doesn't work. How's Whole Foods going to service, you know, those shade-grown tomatoes from Guatemala? But are they going to all of a sudden get unlimited supply to supply 80 million, you know, 60 million customers? Right. I don't know. Okay. So what Jewel has in their market, okay, is that we're close to the customer. We have stores, and there is starting now, and it's it's going to be fully implemented very soon. Home delivery. And also pick, a, you know, click and collect kind of stuff for every store. Um, so we have the resources and the technology because we're a big company doing sixty-five billion dollars in sales to buy well from suppliers, to provide to to upgrade the technology. And yes, were we slow doing it? Absolutely, because everybody was slow from Kroger to us, you know. Because, but today, what's happening in boardrooms? And I was just at a board meeting in New York yesterday, yesterday, the day before. Okay. Um, Basically, what's happening is that people are spending double the money in half the time to get, you know, kind of, let's just say, on an e-commerce uh, right. par, meaning mobile apps and, right. and, and uh, you know, all the good stuff, right? It's fixable. It's fixable. And remember, again, I'll just say Amazon has 1% of the fresh food thing, and still a lot of people like to see their tomatoes, they like to see the fresh fish, they like to see the fresh part of the supermarket is always going to attract people, okay? Um, I think the supermarket of today is not going to look like the supermarket of tomorrow. This is my personal opinion. I'm not talking, I don't run the company, I don't run Albertsons. My partner, I own 30%. We're on the board. But besides that, this isn't exactly, we don't, you know, it's a private company, so it's, it's you know, the managing partners run the business. And, and management, but basically, um, you know, um, those those changes uh, that need to occur are occurring, and and um, and and I You're think. You're very confident with the management. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, yeah, I'm confident in management. I think all management that's existing today comes from a, a, you know, it's there's somewhat of a lag of knowledge. Right. I mean, so an e-commerce kid, I use the word kid, if you got an e-commerce person and it and that person reports to an old line manager who, right. who still doesn't know how to use a whatever, not that I do, I still got a Blackberry, so I'm not exact. Right. The point is that you have to let the culture, you know what I mean, flow through. So you can't cut it off by having an old line executive vice president who's been there 40 years, who, right. understand, you know, who doesn't understand how young people or how people yeah. connect. So it's a, it's a, it's a man the manage management has to change, ownership has to change, but the asset base we have we have incredible brand. By the way, in all these years of Aldi being here, and Aldi is here with a good few hundred, I think a couple hundred stores, our market share has increased. Despite, it really has, and I think we're somewhere in the 45 or something percent market share, which is incredible for a, for a supermarket chain. So yeah, we need to change. We're building new stores. We're renovating new stores. We have one at State at, at um, Clark and Division, which just right. opened, which My is, which, which is uh, if you go in there, it's a, uh, could it be better? I think yes, even more so, more experiential. Right. You know, you showed me in your place that you have a a, 
uh, a, um, a kitchen open that people can see right. what, 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 what you're doing. And I think that's kind of, you know, you need to be able to have things going on that you can see where your food came people from. People like seeing where the food came from. Exactly. So whether it's a roaster, if you have right. a coffee thing, or right. if you have a, you know, even if it's a, I remember in Eastern Europe, I was in Lithuania, and you walk into the stores and they've got fish swimming around, like in, you know, carp. I'll have one of those. They cut it up and you take it home. It's just a lobster. It's the same thing as when you go to a restaurant. You see lobsters, okay? You, you know. So things need to change. They are changing. Um, and, um, and I think we'll do, we'll do fine. But um, not bad. I just think we'll do fine. It'll take some time. Great brand. Really, really yeah, love yeah. the brand here in Chicago. And it needs, it needs to be a strong brand. Refreshed. It, it needs, needs to, to be, be refreshed. refreshed and, and it is. And, and, and I think you'll see in the next couple of months a lot of things going on in that brand. You know, the last thing I want to kind of touch is, is you then morphing back to becoming a farmer. You know, you started out as a kid with the, with the trees yeah, and working yeah, with yeah. your dad, and yeah, now yeah. you got this thing down in South America. Right, okay, right. Okay, why don't you tell our, our friends here that are watching a little bit about your desire to be a farmer, and what have you done in South America? Well, I think there's two aspects to it. Um, when I grew up, uh, we had this little farm couple hundred acres we could we had a little farm and a big farm that's what we called it. Or we got a little farm today or the big farm today and this was I mean just to put it in perspective 18 miles from our house okay right. so it was it would be like if you lived in in, in 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 Rogers Park and you had a house and you had a farm in 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 uh, in, Gla in uh, um, you know in Lake Forest or not even not that far okay right. in Northbrook right so you owned a big farm that was it so we used to go there uh, that's where our farm was, and, uh, and, and, and that was my inheritance. I mean, that was my connection with the earth. I mean, I, I just grew up with, with, I used to plow with mules. I used to plow with mules. We, didn't, we couldn't <laughs> afford a tractor. And I remember looking, you know, we had two big mules, and I just remember as a, like an eight-year-old kid standing like on the feet of, of, the, la of the worker who was an African, African laborer. And I used to stand on his feet, and I used to hold this plow, the furrowed plow and these two, you know, two, and you do this. Big and horse, big ho mules. Big mules. I mean, all I saw was a big ass, you know, right? Two big ass, Jack and Mary, right? And, and this thing had like power, like you talk about horsepower. You've got to go behind two mules, okay? It's like Amish, go, go, to, go to Iowa, you do, they still do it, right? Okay? Amazing. Eventually we bought a Matthew Ferguson 135. It was like, we, we were like in heaven, right? Small little tractor, Canadian tractor. So um, that, that was, you know, it's in, it's in my blood. And so when I, when I came, moved to America, I didn't have any money and didn't have any thoughts of buying farms because I was just trying to make a living here, you know, establish myself. And, um, and then we, you know, 15, 16 years ago, got involved in traveling to Latin America, to Uruguay in particular, which is a great place to visit, safe. It's not Paraguay, it's Uruguay, you know. <laughs> Uh, many, many people have followed us there and bought apartments and visited um, in Chicago and all over the world from South Africa, London, and uh, parts of the United States. And um, my first thing was I went, I bought a farm. But I bought a little farm, 120 acres, and I've got every kind of animal. I mean, I've got cows and sheep and guinea fowl and horses, you know, and that's my, that's, I bought myself a present to remind myself of where I came from. Right. And actually what's so interesting is the land is so similar to South Africa because the countries, the continents were together at one stage and it's actually when I taste the grass and I eat, you know, I mean, I right. put it between, it's like I'm, it's like I'm transformed, I'm, I'm transported for 40 years to South Africa. It's the same, wow. same flora. It's similar a climate. Very similar climate, same belt of, 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 of um, kind of like, uh, you know, to, uh, to grow grapes and stuff like that. But it was, it was one, con it was one continent right. a, a million, five million years ago, okay? Bef before the first May of Daily, right? So, yeah. it's a long time. <laughs> so, um, uh, that, you know, so that's a place I go back to. I go horse riding there, it's near the beach. I have parties there in Uruguay. Everyone who's ever visited Uruguay has come there to visit us. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's and still your main home, that, that first 100 acres you bought? Yeah, well, yeah. it's on my home. We have another home nearby, right, but it's right. kind of like 20 minutes away. It's a little bit like ahead. So, yeah. But then we started getting involved in real agriculture. We own some of the best f um, quality farmland near the agricultural port in Uruguay, which is, which is very productive. Uh, it's a long-term investment um, because it's 
a moderate climate, has lots of water, and, um, and we believe in the shortage of, uh, you know, food shortages over some period of time because of water that's been polluted, whether it's... Yeah. So how big is that, is that farm? We have, about, we have a bunch of farms in one area. We have about uh, uh, 30,000 acres. Wow. It's not huge. By the way, there's farms in Brazil where one farm or one field can be 10,000 acres. I mean, you're right. talking. But, it's, but we, buy, we own the best stuff near the port and, and really great stuff. So that's, that's kind of like a, a circle. And then the other thing that's interesting is that it, we just recently last year with Goldman Sachs as our partner, bought a very large uh, and very high end, more of a Whole Foods kind of feel uh, um, supermarket chain in Uruguay. So actually, knowing what I know from here, which is not operational, but I've been in the board, I've heard enough, I've learned, I mean, I've been in the board right. long enough to earn something, that was led me to this great brand there, which I've always admired. So, you know, there's a natural thing to... to this has right. been a great conversation. Yeah, I think yeah, that yeah. Uh, when we think about food today, we think about farm to table. Yeah. You're really the perfect example of farm to table because you you got the farm, yeah. you got the, the distribution, you got the grocery yeah, store. Yeah, yeah. You take it right to the customer's table. They can, and, you know, and hopefully someday at Jewel, you'll be able to walk in and actually sit down and have your meal there if you want to, yeah, like yeah. you do with some of the other yeah, uh, yeah. other higher end um, grocery yeah. chains. Uh, but it's, uh, you're certainly having a, a big impact on the industry. And yeah. You know, uh, it's, not as, it's not as connected as, as, as you would believe or made out. Um, you know, they're all, you know, the, the farms we own don't produce necessarily right. that thing. But I'll tell you what's interesting in a place like Uruguay is when you sit down and have a meal in Punta del Este, which is kind of a resort place, okay, um, um, you know, or even in Montevideo, they say, you know that everything you're eating is produced within 150 kilometers from where you are sitting. Because all the market gardens, all the places that grow the tomatoes and the vegetables and the thing are within like, you know, an arc of 100 kilometers from Montevideo. And the cattle, all grass-fed, um, almost organic, but all grass-fed, by law, there's no antibiotics or hormones in the, you're not allowed to, the, by, by law. So by law. By law. And so the, the meat there, whether it's chick, chicken tastes like chicken you haven't tasted before. It's really, everything's free range because that's the country. I predict that Uruguay, I mean, if Amazon could, they'd buy Uruguay as a source of supply. <laughs> Crazy. Anyway. This has been unbelievable. What a great conversation. What a great opportunity to, to have the people that are watching this be able to see what's going on around the world. So often yeah, I yeah. think we get we get caught up in our little micro thing here yeah, yeah. and we don't take enough time to look what's going on around the world. And uh, yeah. I think that's a great example. I certainly want to go visit the country and I think over the next 12 months or so I hope my wife and I get down there and visit it. It sounds very exciting. Absolutely. And uh, this has been it's just been a pleasure. I really thank want you. to thank you for coming over and spending the time with us. My pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. Great.